So, um, especially with the impact of uh, of the order from Judge Whitley's office um, on the 21st, uh, we since that time we have uh, been preparing for uh, remote instruction until the 28th. And I know that there's been a lot of conversation about that. Certainly. Um, uh, the health department does have the authority to be able to make those decisions through the health and safety code as well as the administrative code. And so uh, we've been uh, uh, working in our, <clears throat> in our world to try to uh, make this remote instruction uh, uh, robust, to try to make it uh, uh, in interesting and engaging and student and parent friendly uh, as we move forward because uh, 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 we got a lot of feedback uh, from the spring and our, our staff and our teachers did uh, uh, and our principals, they did amazing work. Our central office folks, they did amazing work to try to um, have uh, uh, appropriate instructional opportunities for our kids in an emergency situation. And so uh, our values of purpose and innovation and community were on full display in the spring. Um, as the spring wore on, we continued to get uh, feedback and, uh, and and did get some feedback that, um, you know, we, we hope that some things will be a little bit different <clears throat> if we have to do this in the fall. And so beginning really in April, uh, our team started looking at what August might look like uh, and started working on uh, opportunities for professional development for our teachers and for our principals. Uh, and so I just want to say thank you to to uh, our teachers, our principals, our central office staff who have been working really nonstop since that time to try to be the very best prepared that we can be on August the 17th as we as we open schools um, at this point in, <coughs> in a remote environment. So um, uh, we want to talk about that. There are so many things to think about. Opening school in a normal year, whatever a normal year is, but in a normal year in buildings, opening school is a very difficult thing. For example, we we try to have our course requests in by by February, March at the latest to be able to have a, a good strong uh, um, schedule uh, uh, to be to be made for our teachers and for our students. And now we compress that time into about a couple of weeks. And so. So it's things like that that uh, uh, makes it this a very complex situation, a very heavy lift to be able to try to uh, to to do that. But I, I promise you that our team is working as hard as we can work to make sure that on day one, on August the 17th, uh, we have uh, an engaging, positive uh, school open <coughs> school opening. Uh, however, uh, there's a lot to that, and so. I'll be quiet and I'm going to let our team describe to you about the kinds of things that we've been working on to make this a successful, um, successful event. So, Dr. Schnapps. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. So, uh, fast forward, uh, July 21st, uh, last week, um, the, where there was a, uh, uh, the joint order was issued by Tarrant County, the health professionals. Um, of, of Tarrant County, uh, of the city of Arlington, and the city of Burleson issuing the order that uh, is to go into effect until 11.59 uh, p.m. Uh, September 27th. And so really that's the, the purpose of this, this workshop tonight is to discuss kind of how does this impact GCISD and what does this mean now? Uh, because basically this, this uh, joint order states that we will be in full remote status uh, through that time. And so there are four really major stipulations in this, in this joint order, uh, and I want to highlight those very quickly. Um, the first one just says the school system shall not reopen for on-campus face-to-face instruction or activities until that, that September 28th date. There are a few exceptions here, and I want to uh, point those out. Uh, the first one being that uh, admin, staff, teachers, they may be on campus. Uh, to in a, in, a, in the physical setting to conduct the the virtual remote learning um, activities, um, you know, while following the social distancing and facial coverings, those guidelines issued by the, the state. Uh, and so, um, you know, although students uh, will be in remote fashion, our, our staff can be uh, in our buildings in a physical setting conducting those 
those uh, instructional activities. The second one, uh, the exception is all school-sponsored student events and activities, uh, including but not limited to clubs, sports, band, choir, fairs, exhibitions, academic and or athletic competitions, may only take place remotely or outdoors with social, distance, social distancing requirements of six feet, the facial coverings, and all the other safety protocols uh, determined by GCISD. And we're going to talk through these, what this means uh, for those student groups that I just outlined. The third exception is for our students that receive special, ed uh, special education services, uh, that special education instruction may occur when necessary and in accordance with TA guidelines so long as, and when feasible, the um, facial coverings are worn uh, and the social distancing of the six feet uh, is followed. And last on the exception, students whose individual education plans cannot be implemented with remote learning or who have limited household connectivity to the internet may be, may be provided in-person instruction with social distancing and facial coverings. And so again, we're gonna talk through those. Um, that was the first stipulation. The second of the order just states that um, the schools shall reopen um, prior to September 28th to provide the virtual remote or distance learning uh, opportunities. Um, and, and again, so that instruction, that medium is going to be remote. However, uh, you can have staff on site to provide the meals uh, along with uh, the other instructional activities that need to take place. Uh, the third stipulation, uh, school uh, personnel, again, permitted to return to school campuses and facilities to provide those, those instructional activities, uh, the food distribution, uh, the free and reduced lunch program will continue to uh, to uh, continue, and then uh, administrative duties outlined, uh, you know, by the by the job scope and the TEA requirements. And then last, uh, two weeks prior to us reopening uh, or, or allowing students for in-person or on-campus instruction, uh, the written plan, GCISD's written plan, must be submitted to the local health authority, the, to Tarrant County. Um, as well as made available uh, to parents, teachers, and the staff and the general public, which will be done via online. And so um, that is the, the joint order uh, in kind of a, a summary. And at this point, we want to talk through what does that look like? What does that mean for GCISD and moving forward? And so as Dr. Ryan mentioned, we we our team has uh, worked diligently in, in transitioning to to making this work for us now that we're pretty much fully remote uh, through September 28th. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Rogers. As she's gonna talk through the remote instructional model. Good evening all. Um, when we started our planning and visioning, we began with the end in mind. And the end is what is that student experience and that student academic growth? What does that look like, sound like, feel like? And there was, um, what does that look like now? And we continue to see what is that going to look like with intentional thoughts and protocols to implement to support teachers, parents, and student when they are in remote learning. So we focused on the best practices for online learning to support students. And what are the tools that we have uh, to equip teachers so that August 17th, they are ready to go with excellence? So over this summer and currently, CNI and instructional technology are focused first on the foundational course structure in Canvas and in Seesaw. Those are the two learning management systems. So staff created a module-based blueprint to provide teachers with a scope and sequence, the tools to integrate their voice, assignments, assessments, activities, and more so that their students could have the best possible learning and engaging experience. Engagement is a critical piece, whether you're face-to-face -face or virtual. And so engagement in the live learning or synchronous time, and then in their independent, independent learning time or asynchronous time. So our focus was providing tools and essentials specifically for live learning time. And Lainey's going to talk more about that in a second. And then providing the tools, equipment, and training for their independent learning time. 
And finally, there is a transition to support our kiddos. And so we are developing a remote learning course in the system they will be using, either a Canvas or Seesaw, that will help them with the best practices of being a remote learner, using the tools that they will be using daily, whether they are intermittent remote or a full-time remote learner. And always, uh, we recommend a parent can sit with them so they can also experience this with their kiddos so they know and understand the tools that their kiddo will be working in. So overall, the team has worked diligently to provide the tools and the framework and so now Lainey will talk about the support and training to continue that. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Good evening, board. Um, I'm excited to share with you that what our team has been focused on in preparing for um, full remote this fall. Um, as Kay mentioned, our learning management system and workflow, when we receive feedback from our community, they wanted consistency in that. And so our secondary teachers have all had training over the summer um, through Canvas and how to use that as, along with the work in Seesaw to provide that consistency for our community. Um, also, the second part of that to be fall remote ready is the professional development that we are developing right now and designing for our teachers. Um, we were really lucky when COVID hit after spring break that we already had relationships with our students. And so now we will have to start full remote and learn how to develop those relationships. So in partnership with Kay's team, um, and her expertise, we are um, going to provide that training for our teachers and how you start the school year full, full remote and develop those relationships. Along with, um, we were at the end of our standards that we have to follow um, by the state after spring break and most of us were in review of those standards. Well, now we will have to be able to provide new learning of those standards um, from the beginning. And so along with Kay and her partnership, we're developing professional development um, that really addresses how to do that. Um, also, we will continue this professional development through our professional learning communities. I'm now going to hand it over to Dr. Shiver, who's going to talk to you about our fall schedule. Might be muted, Dr. Shiver. Can you hear us now, Dr. Shiver? We cannot hear her. Cal, can you hear me? I can hear you, Lance. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, Chip in here for uh, to talk about middle school and high school schedules uh, as Dr. Shiver uh, works through her, some of her technical difficulties. Uh, based off some of the feedback that uh, that Lainey uh, mentioned in, during her, uh, her her portion of the presentation, one of our goals with with our with the design uh, of our schedules at the at the middle school, high school, and elementary schools um, is to ensure that our, our kids are getting live instruction from their teachers. Uh, one of the biggest pieces of feedback is that 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 opportunity to have um, live instruction uh, married with uh, some independent work time uh, built into a kid's uh, structured day. Um, the the ability to have a a, a better understanding of uh, when I'm logging in, what I'm looking at, and how do we ultimately uh, create a learning environment that is as traditional as we can uh, in a remote remote virtual setting. Uh, in, in collaboration with Dr. Rogers uh, and her expertise there at uh, uh, University Prep, uh, getting feedback about what schedules have worked for them uh, and what schedule is the most conducive for uh, learning in a virtual setting. Um, these schedules were shared with you uh, uh, via um, board update last week and, and were shared with our community uh, on Friday uh, and, and are in a draft form uh, and, and, and are, are making sure that we continue um, to refine those practices and make sure that they align for what, what's going to be in the best interest of our students um, come August 17th. Um, looking at specifically at the middle school sk schedules, um, that's a lot. It's a long day. Um, and so met with our middle school principals um, today to, to discuss exploring other options as well. 
that might mirror more of what our high school's uh, schedules are going to look like to really chunk the day um, to, to uh, not overwhelm our kids to make sure that what we're asking them to do in a remote setting is manageable uh, and, and feasible and, and really provides the best uh, learning experience for them. Um, is Sheila available to talk or is it still mute? Uh, it looks like it's still muted. We're trying a few things. Okay. Um, if, if Brad, you'll click to the next slide, we can I'll talk through the, the, the high school schedules a little bit. Um, you can see there with the, the, the comprehensive high schools uh, schedule uh, aligns with what a traditional day would look like. Uh, and, and that was one of our big goals uh, in creating that experience that would align very seamlessly uh, through transition uh, if, if we are going from a remote setting to a virtual or to a face to face setting that that seamless transition uh, and then the last schedule there on the right is an example of a um, upperclassmen schedule for collegiate academy um, that would uh, is obviously a, a different animal unto itself with a lot of um, classes with TCC um, TCC has gone full virtual for the entire fall semester. Uh, which uh, their classroom, their their professors have the autonomy to either offer synchronous or asynchronous uh, learning as well. Um, so you're going to have a mix in those classes, but uh, it's a little bit, it, it's still that creating that structure for the kids that they would see uh, if they were walking on on uh, the Collegiate Academy uh, campus. I think I'll just keep rolling right along. Like Brad, unless you want to chime in. Yeah, Kyle, is, is Sheila is Sheila back online? So did that work, Sheila? Still not. So a part of our uh, process as we as we continue to, to refine and look at attendance and grading uh, and, and, and the guidance from the state is to ensure that one, our kids are getting uh, engaged each day, uh, making sure that they are uh, connecting uh, in the live lessons as well as uh, completing progress checks throughout the day. Uh, one of the big things that the, the discussion points that we're having right now is some beginning of year assessments uh, and ensuring that uh, we have a good assessment of where our kids are uh, so that we can uh, best refine and design uh, uh, virtual learning experiences that meet the needs of where they are. Uh, as, as, as we said at the beginning, um, you know, we, we did our very best uh, in, in an emergency setting. Um, it's time that we're, gonna, we're going to assess and, and ensure that we know where our kids are um, to design that learning to, to meet their needs. Um, as a stipulation from TEA, uh, our grading will go back to the way it was uh, uh, pre-spring uh, break. Um, so with our, with our pre-K through fourth graders, we will be using a standards-based report card. Uh, and then fifth grade will be getting, we'll, we'll uh, transition into a traditional grading practices uh, as as per our policies. Middle school will be uh, the same as what is in our policy, and high school will be uh, um, using the same model that they had. Uh, we have traditionally come to know as our grading practices uh, at the high schools as well. Um, using Canvas as a tool to uh, provide assessments, uh, as well as using Canvas as a tool for grading, which I think Kyle may get into some of the the details about Canvas and what it what will, what it will be able to do to assist our staff uh, at the secondary level and make sure that um, our kids have ability um, to be in connected, be engaged, uh, and have a great learning management system that will help support them throughout. Hey, Cal, were we able to pull uh, Sheila back or? I have um, Sheila. We'll try to unmute one more time and see, and then I brought Lynette over just in case. Wynette, are you there? Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Wynette, I'm gonna, I want to take this back to the uh, elementary sample oh. schedule because I think it's important that we talk through just the, the different kind of variations in here and the opportunity it's going to bring for all learners. Will you just touch on this? Yes. Um, similar to tapping into Kay's expertise, um, I had a former teacher who um, left last year and was teaching for a virtual academy and since we don't have a lot of experience in a virtual elementary world um, i contacted her and asked her to to meet with some of my teachers which she did and she provided her schedule and so some of the conversations with the elementary folks are um, we 
worked on some of this based on the feedback that we got from her. So again, trying to tap into a little bit of somebody who'd been just a bit ahead of us. So what we have worked on and talked with our staffs about is providing face-to-face -face time for each of the core content areas, 30-minute uh, blocks, and then having time for the kids to either work independently, um, some of them will be able to do that, but also time for small groups. And that was real important. I know for my teachers, um, they're already trying to figure out, so how am I gonna do that? Will I have enough time to switch everybody around? And we've got some, I'm sorry, I got a dog that just started whining. I'm really, really sorry. Um, but being able to work with kids in small groups is gonna be really important for us. We weren't able to do that as much in the spring as we would in a regular classroom, but we think that this opportunity along with the enhanced WebEx features that Kyle talked about today will allow a lot of this, um, a lot more of that to happen. Um, I will tell you guys kind of something that I thought was kind of humorous and as we're, we've rolled this out and parents have had an opportunity to look at it, I've already had several emails from parents saying, there's no recess time in there. So I've assured them that they're gonna have quite a bit of autonomy and they will be able to figure out when they can build in a recess time for their children within the day schedule. But um, most of the feedback I've gotten so far, both from staff and from parents has been pretty positive. Well, thank you, Annette. Uh, appreciate you and appreciate your collaboration in, in helping uh, us build this sample schedule. and. Uh, trustees, we have not worked in uh, the possibility of animals uh, reporting to work, so just want you rest assured on that. So I'm gonna. He's been quiet the whole meeting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to fast forward. Try, we can try Sheila if you need it to. I think we got might have had her back in. Sheila, well, we. We'll let's let's uh, okay. we're now on the the special pop, so we'll bring her in. She's she and Lance will be uh, leading us through a few more slides here okay. in a little bit, but. I want to uh, to head now to uh, discussing how we're going to serve our our gifted uh, learners, and and Julie's going to lead us through this. Good evening, everybody. Looking at the elementary schedule more closely was a perfect segue into part of what I want to highlight for you this evening. And so, for my summary, I'll start with basically the left half of your screen talking about GT services. GT lead, uh, GT specialists will be able to work with their campuses and the homeroom teachers to identify times when they can pull the GT lead students for their um, GT lead lessons and curriculum like they always have. If you remember on the slide you just saw for elementary, there were several times per day where the students can work independently or they can work in small groups. And so that again will allow the GT specialists to work out the time when they will, uh, the identified GT students will um, have that need met for them. Um, uh, they will offer both live instruction and asynchronous learning for those gifted and talented students. Related to secondary GT, there will be GT sections of pre-AP and AP courses like we have traditionally done. And a quick note there, um, a number of universities across the nation and locally decided that they were not going to offer virtual or online opportunities for advanced placement summer institutes. But even with that, we still had 53 teachers who signed up and spent four or five days virtually with this outstanding training. And that's on top of what we asked them to do as a district related to their Canvas and other work. Related to Aspire Academy, um, for elementary, the bullet there, the Aspire teachers will be following the same schedule as Glen Hope. And for middle and high school, um, we have been working tirelessly to build the courses in Canvas. When it comes to the new 11th grade Aspire courses, we started on that in the spring and continued even that virtually during the closure. Um, Dr. Ryan mentioned how hard our teachers have been working this summer, and I would just like to echo that. Um, in more than 20 years, I've never been prouder to work with teachers and to lead teachers than I have been during the closure and this summer. And they just have such a high standard of excellence, not just for themselves, but for um, students. And that has really shown through this summer as they have given so much of their time 
to work on building these courses and to build engaging learning experiences for the kids. Um, as a quick note there across the bottom, we've had a number of parents ask us if we'll be still able to offer um, GT testing. We do plan on doing some of that in the fall as we can following district and state guidelines related to safety. We have done a little bit of that this week and um, today was our first day and um, followed all the guidelines and uh, knock on wood, we had a great first day in getting some of our secondary and out of district students tested. All right, thank you so much, Julie. Uh, now we'll turn it over to Amy Montemayor to uh, discuss our dyslexia and dysgraphia support. Um, good evening, trustees. Um, so a lot of what you heard from Julie, and I'm going to echo also. So in regards to intervention, the literacy interventionist will provide both that synchronous and asynchronous intervention. Um, the question of when will that intervention take place as we work to supplement um, that tier one instruction. Um, so as you saw in the schedules for elementary, that red independent time um, is when the interventionists are going to work with campus administrators to schedule time um, for the kids to have live learning. And then there'll also be um, some independent work that is pushed out through Seesaw and Canvas. Um, in regards to dyslexia intervention in secondary, those students are already scheduled for a dyslexia class period, and so they will follow um, that schedule. Um, we are working on ordering materials in dyslexia intervention. The kids share um, materials. Obviously, we need materials in the hands of students. Um, so orders have been placed, um, and we will get that distributed to students. Um, the interventionists um, were all adamant, and as a best practice to do some pre-assessment um, from the spring learning and also the summer time off to determine any areas um, that need to be worked on um, as we move forward in the fall. Um, we will continue to progress monitor weekly um, as we have been in the past. Um, I already addressed the additional activities through Seesaw and Canvas. Um, and just like Julie said, um, initial dyslexia assessment will continue to follow guidelines of special services. Um, we were able to get some students tested this summer, working in conjunction um, with some of Dr. Wishman's folks. And so that um, are the plans for dyslexia and dysgraphia moving into the fall. All right, which is a good a good segue with, with Dr. Wishman and, and special services. Dr. Wishman, you there? I am here. <clears throat> Greetings to everyone. Um, First thing I want to highlight is we will need to do some ARD meetings to establish two different types of plans of learning for each student. And excuse my voice, I'm struggling with my allergies and it's settled right here. Um, <clears throat> we'll develop two learning plans for students um, for face-to-face -face when that is the option available per Tarrant County orders. Um, and then also a remote learning plan. The remote learning will be more intensive than it was in the spring. Um, however, in the spring, our, many of our special ed services were provided through live instruction um, through the WebEx uh, medium. So um, when we do have the opportunity to be in face-to-face -face learning per um, state and local authorities, instruction will be provided based on what is determined in an ARD committee meeting. At that same time, when a parent has selected remote learning, um, that will be a combination of live services or live instruction in addition to um, asynchronous or independent work. Um, we will also be supplementing with learning packets to facilitate the learning. We are pulling together materials, um, manipulatives to support student IEP goals to facilitate the learning for our students who are working in an alternate curriculum. Um, we are also considering some by appointment services, which will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis um, for some services that really do need the hands-on um, for um, supporting students. <clears throat> in the meantime, if you'll go to the next slide, um, under the Tarrant County orders, um, we have been diligently working to 
figure out a plan that will balance the safety concerns of our students as well as our staff um, and balance that with the provision of service that may be allowable under these administrative orders or these Tarrant County orders. <clears throat> what we have come up with is we are going to continue to monitor student data the first three weeks of school and then beginning around September 8th, we will phase in some services for some students. We have defined some administrative parameters in which the ARD committees will make these decisions. This is based on the exception that Dr. Schnauz highlighted at the very beginning of the presentation, and I've put on this slide as a reminder. So this is a reference to the exception for special education instruction, um, but there's also the caution about the use of safety for the students and the staff. So the criteria that we've identified would be basically our program students. So our students who are um, like our life skill students and our RISE program, our ECSE, which is our early childhood special education, formerly known as PPCD, our behavior program, so which are set, reset, and able classes. Um, but these are students that did not make the anticipated rate of progress in the remote learning setting. Um, this would also include students who use AAC devices, their um, communication devices that are technology driven. So um, those services will be based on individual student progress, and that will be determined in our meetings as to which of these students would need to come up. Some of our students made decent progress at the rate we expected, so um, they may not need these phased and type of services. Some additional services that are difficult and have been challenging to implement through remote learning are services that require hands-on um, manipulation or physical manipulation, such as our direct occupational therapy and direct physical therapy, to be able to position the children in um, the angle or um, seating position that is required for them to uh, maintain their muscle um, mass, et cetera. The last one is Braille instruction and orientation and mobility services for our visually impaired. The Braille instruction, I think that's a pretty obvious one that it is um, next to impossible to provide over technology due to the need to have the tactile input of the Braille. We are looking at a maximum amount of time being up to two half days a week. And this is so that we can maximize social distancing and allow for the safety precautions for staff and students. Many of these students that we are looking at considering for um, this criteria are students who would struggle with wearing a mask and also may not have the ability to understand the reason why they need to stay six feet apart. Um, these students often require hand over hand instruction as well. So this does present some safety challenges to our staff as well as the students. So we will need to uh, go with smaller numbers and spread them out so we can uh, maximize the safety. All right, thank you, Joanne. And now uh, we have Emberly Hill here to talk about our social emotional supports that we're gonna have in place for our students and our staff as we begin the school year. Emberly? Good evening. Um, as we all know, social emotional is gonna be very, very important as we return to start school again. We've got some new pieces in place. We have purchased a new character education curriculum. It has a tremendous amount of social emotional supports. That's called character strong at the secondary level and it's called purposeful people at the elementary level. Today, the counselors were trained in, in those curriculums. We also purchased their on-demand virtual PD that is directed at teachers for how to implement certain social emotional traits in their in their classrooms if if their kids seem to be struggling with something and this whole program promotes building relationships very similar to restorative practices which we've been using for years a kind of focus on kindness throughout uh, also there's been a collaboration between 
CNI and the counseling team to write curriculum in Seesaw and Canvas. And the whole first week is really focused on relationship building and social emotional support. And then after that first week, character strong lessons are part of each core curriculum content after that. So that it's just part of the lesson for the teachers. It's not an additional piece, but we make sure that the students are supported in their social and emotional well being. Each content has a specific character focus to ensure that the students have a variety of lessons and are not going to be repeated in class one over. Teachers have been and will be shown how to access the material and encouraged how to use them. And elementary's written circle up tools uh, so that and shown the teachers how to access that. We could go to the next. We also have purchased a new survey tool called Panorama. We've contracted with this company. We determine what questions we're going to ask, and we can also develop custom questions. And the focus is really social and emotional for Panorama. I've listed just a few of the topics, but there are many, many more. So they've got college and career readiness, emotional regulation, grit, growth mindset, school and classroom climate, and just tons more. And teachers will be able to see the results of their classrooms and then they're access the playbook for ideas on how to target those specific areas. We're, we're going to use the same tool to assess teacher social and emotional well being so that we can address our teachers and provide them the support that they need as well. And our grade band teams are going to be begin to work with panorama here in the next few weeks to pull those questions together. Counselors are going to continue to contact students via WebEx and phone to check on families as they did last spring. They'll also be a vital part for reaching out to those families who we haven't heard from once school starts and getting those kids connected back into school. And we'll provide the teachers some training to ensure that the teachers know how to notify counselors if they find any, if they're worried about any of the students for any reason. Uh, I wanted to, before we run over to Dr. Grope and Dr. Shriver here, I wanted to just remind, uh, tell you guys what some of the target uh, character traits are that they'll be focusing on. Commitment, patience, kindness, honesty, respect, selflessness, forgiveness, and humility. So traits we want all of our students to have a good understanding of. Thank you. Thank you, Emberly. And so now, uh, Dr. Shiver, I think I think she's back with us, and Dr. Gropel um, is is still here. So one of the things I want to kind of touch back on the order uh, that we talked through. One of the exceptions was it did not allow for student activity or student events uh, to be held on campus. Uh, here is is something that uh, that that Sheila and Lance are going to talk through. Uh, we are wanting to have parent events where we can. Uh, educate and inform our parents on what the the 2021 school year is going to look like, what um, you know, what the schedules will look like. Um, it'll give parents an opportunity to to meet uh, the, their teacher and the staff and faculty. So I'm going to let Sheila and Lance talk through some of this. Okay, I'm going to give this a good try again and see if my audio is working now. Um, you are good. Awesome. So now my video is not working. I can't see anyone. Um, only one thing at a time over here. So one of the things that we think is really important, beginning this year remote offers different challenges than we had in the spring when we already had relationships built with our parents and our students. So we feel that it's very important that we use the few weeks left before um, the first day of instruction for students to make some contact with our parents, to have opportunities, uh, both individual and in small group, to set the year off on a good start, um, help our parents know what to expect regarding schedules, uh, class activities, beginning of year assessments are really important, uh, getting going for the year so that the teachers understand uh, where their students are. So, each campus will be setting a schedule of how they are going to provide these opportunities for our parents to connect with our staff at the campus, uh, making sure that they have the connectivity they need. Uh, for our fourth and fifth graders, 
uh, they're going to have new devices that they have not worked with before in the Chromebooks. So um, having small informational sessions, as I said, in those individual or small groups where the parent and the student gets the opportunity to really learn to use the new device that they have in that Chromebook so that they can be successful on the first day of school. Also with our pre-K and kinder students, they're going to receive their iPads. So there's gonna be this process of turning in old devices, checking out new devices, and then having those opportunities to meet in small groups, individuals with teachers, staff at the campus, so that they're able to start the year knowing what to expect, how to support their learner through that, uh, both with that seesaw uh, learning management system. So we feel like this is uh, the opportunity for us to connect. As we said, focusing on the parents, um, it's also going to give us an opportunity to interact with our students as we would expect that the students would uh, come with their parents. Um, so it will not be a tradition to meet the teacher um, or some of the registration events that we typically have at the beginning of the year. Uh, but we do feel like we are setting up for success in order to uh, meet the needs of our parents, uh, answer some of the questions that they have right now so that we are able to start the year um, everyone prepared uh, on that August 17th for the first day of learning. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in working with our secondary principals, uh, we're going to cre create some uh, informational videos uh, to share with uh, parents uh, and, and students and uh, that, that kind of outline some of the expectations, some of the schedules that they'll be following, uh, assessments, and then really the, the, the big thing for our secondary folks uh, is the adjustment and, and transition into Canvas uh, and how we will utilize that learning management system uh, from a student perspective, from a parent perspective, and from a staff perspective, uh, using those tools um, to, to better, <clears throat> excuse me, better create uh, a learning experience that, that meets the needs of, of where we are uh, today compared to where we were a year ago. Uh, also for us is a, is a transition at the secondary level uh, from our ninth graders coming in, uh, uh, turning in a Chromebook and getting a, a laptop uh, which Kyle and his team will turn around very quickly, and I'm sure he'll outline that in more detail to go back to those uh, elementary kids that, that Sheila discussed. Uh, and really uh, looking at registration differently and finding face-to-face uh, -face opportunities to educate our parents uh, uh, different from a traditional uh, registration with large groups coming on campus uh, and, and going through the registration needs, but really uh, being very intentional and uh, identifying portions of our population to make sure that we're reaching them and connecting with them. Uh, and, and if that means uh, taking the registration process off campus and exploring different options to uh, meet our community where they are and, and what they need uh, to get uh, educated and better prepared for uh, uh, virtual learning on August 17th. Thank you, Lance. And that's a great segue into Kyle as far as uh, technology uh, distribution. Kyle? Absolutely. As mentioned, uh, we have roughly about 4,000 devices that we need to alternate through various students and grade levels. So that's um, in our intake of our freshman devices, the new devices, and then moving those down to our fourth graders and our fifth graders to kindergartners. So there's a lot of logistics that will be happening over the next couple of weeks with our target goal of every student having a device for the first day of school. Um, it's imperative that, you know, we get those devices in, we do clean, sanitize those devices, and if they happen to have any damage or things that need fixing, we get those repaired to be reissued out. So we're on track and working closely with those um, parent informational meetings with the campuses to coordinate all those times so that we can get devices moving. When we look at our mobile hotspots, uh, just a snapshot of where we're at, as a total for the district, we have 625 mobile hotspots. Of those, we currently have 140 that are available for distribution. Uh, we anticipate that those will go out, so we have another 100 on order, just based on you know the typical economy that we're seeing right now, we are anticipating a wider need happening from there. So uh, within the first couple of weeks, those additional 100 are supposed to be here by September. So feeling comfortable, we'll have about 240 units that we can distribute to students. 
We are running reports in, in online registration right now where we ask those questions. If you need device uh, connectivity and we do follow up with families as well. And the other thing that we have started doing is really doing monthly reports on the usage of those internet hotspots that we distribute out there to make sure that we are using those hotspots and we don't have any that are sitting out there not being used that we can redistribute as needed. When we look at our classroom technology, our interactive display project that we started earlier in the school year has been completed. Um, that interactive display is now going to play a central part in the way that we can distribute out WebEx and other interactive lessons from the classroom. So we are in the process of installing cameras inside the cam in the side of the classroom that attach to that interactive display. So the teacher can be teaching from in front of their actual classroom. You would see the teacher, you would see their interactive display behind them. They could share the interactive board um, desktop with the students and all that can be recorded as well to be re, um, re evaluated or re looked at by the teachers overall or by the students. We currently have 500 of those cameras on hand uh, working with each principal. We've been identifying key classrooms that we need those to be installed at. Uh, we got ahead of the curve and getting all those ordered um, ahead of a lot of our peers. So we're in pretty good shape on that to get those outfitted in a lot of our classrooms. In addition, we've um, acquired mobile camera units, which is kind of like a an iPod, uh, an iPad on a um, IV stand. Those are going to be used more for CTE or other classes where we need an adjustable camera angle to maybe say in shop class where I can look at the engine while the work is being done or other kind of classes like that. So we have mobile camera units that we're going to be using in each one of those uh, scenarios. We also have acquired, um, we still have our projectors. So we have our repurposed projectors from the classroom and additional portable interactive panels. So if we get to a point to where we need to take um, non-instructional space to make instructional spaces due to social distancing, we have the technology and, um, and capability to do that as well. And then the final step of that is the evaluation of reinforced sound. As you can imagine now with teachers wearing masks in the classroom, the audio level of a teacher teaching could be a huge factor. So looking at microphones for our teachers to be able to project their sound more clearly in the classroom and as well into the um, WebEx environment. Uh, it was talked a little bit earlier about some software updates from WebEx and Canvas. Our WebEx platform does integrate into Canvas to where it can automatically do attendance. It can automatically pass grades back and forth, automatically set up office hours and different class settings for our teachers where our teachers are going to have one interface through Canvas to be able to interact with live lessons and recorded lessons as well. So that's an exciting feature. And then finally, um, to technical support, we will continue our contactless locker support system. That has worked out very well. We'll be expanding those lockers throughout the district to all different uh, district level facilities. This allows for 24 seven device access. As you know, in our online world now, if that student device is not working at home, all learning stops. So we needed a way to be able to ensure instant access to swapping devices out. And that's what our locker system is going to be able to achieve for us to where they can go to a designated area, automatically pick up a loaner device and turn in their broken device for repair and minimizing any downtime of instruction that might happen um, for our students. And uh, expanded help desk hours as well. And we will do our curbside support as needed. And as Lance and Sheila mentioned, we will be working with instructional technology for a lot more parent technology type classes to help um, ease any any transition of technology help and how to guide on the devices for all of our parents in the technology world. So that's um, that's what we have so far and working forward. Thank you, Kyle. And here uh, to talk about our nutrition services and transportation is Paula Barbaro. Good evening, trustees. Thank you, Dr. Schnauz. So uh, the seamless summer program, the curbside meal program that we've become familiar with for the summer ends the week before school begins. Um, I'll touch on it in a moment in the other slide, but beginning the week of August 17th, we now fall under the National School Lunch Program at that point, which means there's a different set of rules by which the department has to operate. All along through the summer, they were obviously preparing for both curbside and in-person type of feeding. Now we're kind of focused more so again on curbside and some of the latest rules. Uh, we've got staff that are returning. It'll be the first time that we're really able to be in person with many of them trying to break them up into different groups, 
managing the gathering sizes and those types of things to conduct a lot of the training. As you know, typically in a normal school year, whatever that is anymore, uh, there is a lot of training that goes on uh, leading up to the first day of school. That usually lasts about a week and a half. And with the additional things that need to be in place for our staff, the new protocols of how we would even do uh, in person, obviously all of the protocols that are, are for a curbside and everything related to the pandemic, all of that is going to take them at least two weeks of with the various groups. Probably the most important item or bullet on this particular slide is the last one. It is imperative, it is very important that our department provide as many meals to free and reduced families as possible, either through the curbside delivery process or by making delivery of meals similar to what we did towards the uh, end of the spring there. Uh, we're going to encourage as many families as, as, as we can to apply. There are many benefits that go way beyond the uh, school lunch program for those families. And then for all of our other families, we want to encourage them as well to, to purchase meals from the department. Any revenue that the department receives is unique for them. As you know, they have their own fund balance. Uh, we had a healthy fund balance that were uh, allowed the department to manage through the spring and will allow the department to manage through some of the uh, changes that we're seeing here at the beginning of the school year. But all revenue is certainly of great benefit and very important in terms of uh, the fund balance for this particular department. So in terms of the uh, operations that begin on August 17th, two major things. All applications have to be on file basically for the free and reduced program. And now there is a verification process that must take place at the curbside that was not necessary during the summer months. Uh, for that reason, there will be a, a big outreach program by the department itself to reach all eligible families, make them aware of the changes, encourage them to come pick up meals, uh, and do those kinds of things. And they have already put a plan into place for any families uh, that are unable to pick up meals on the Wednesdays, it will be a, a, a bundle uh, situation again, where you pick up five meals on the Wednesday. They will, uh, reach out to those families by phone or by email overnight and uh, have created a plan to deliver meals on Thursday uh, so that we're maximizing the number of families receiving meals during that process. Three sites are going to be used for curbside meals. That's Timberline Elementary, Grapevine Elementary, and Grapevine Middle School. Um, and then we'll move on to transportation as I know we're, we're close on time. Obviously, we have staff returning. Uh, we've had a, we have a number that have shared with us that they won't be returning given some of the uh, situations that we're looking at. And one of the most important things will be to actually get the survey information from our parents and our special services department to know what service will be needed uh, in the first week of school as some students will be coming to school. That will be the first set of employees that will need to go through training. Uh, like any other year, this department too has almost two weeks of training that takes place before the first day of school and now there will be additional training that will need to be provided It'll be the first time that they are really together again trying to do this in, in different gatherings and groupings of people following all the safety protocols so that they can learn about the procedures that they need to follow, how they need to instruct students boarding the bus, uh, handling the special needs students and obviously the disinfecting of the bus uh, procedure and protocol. We, are, we have purchased uh, misters for all of the buses so that there will be regular and routine uh, missing of the of the school buses. And so an initial set of personnel that will get trained and go through those routines, be prepared for the first day of school, while other staff are working in other departments to help support them, help our uh, facility staff prepare our buildings and other areas. And I failed to mention that about nutrition workers, about 20 of those also doing that. Um, and then switching out the number of people that are then coming in for their training as we move into the month of September. Dr. Schatz? Yeah, thank you, Paula. So, as Paula mentioned, you know, we all strive to meet those safety protocols and the resources uh, that we're going to use uh, to to uh, to meet the safety protocols will be uh, some of the personal protection equipment, or PPE, what we like to say. And so, Diane is here to give us an update on kind of where we, where we sit on the PPE for GCISD. Thank you. What I'm not going to go uh, through this bulleted list with you, but just to let you know that we've had, um, we've received uh, some PPE allocation from TEA 
We've received about half of it. Half of it came in last week and we're still waiting on the rest, but you can see there of what we're expecting from TEA and all other PPE we've been able to, uh, we're going to work in our CARES Act uh, grant funding. One thing I just want to mention is that we have purchased desk shields for all of elementary students and teachers. Um, and for secondary, we have purchased net gaiters um, that will um, come up over the nose. Um, and the next slide, I think, um, Brad kind of gives, shows some pictures of what that looked like. So those are the desk shields we bought for elementary. Um, and then those, there's a picture of the net gaiters uh, for secondary students. That's all. All right. Thank you, Dave. And uh, now we have Brian Gerlich and Kevin Starnes talk about uh, athletics. Um, good evening, trustees. Uh, in early June, our, our programs were able to start offering our strength and conditioning and our sports skill instruction. And those programs are continuing throughout the summer. And as of last week, the new Tarrant County guidelines created a little bit of a challenge for some of our programs. Um, according to the Tarrant County order, everything must be outdoors which for most of our sports was not a big problem, but for basketball and volleyball, it's created some uh, challenging situations and our coaches have had to become very creative in finding some things for our kids to do. But they're working through all those things and wearing the mask unless they're actively exercising and of course social distancing at all times. When Tarrant County came out with their order, the UIL also revised their calendar as well as far as some start dates go. And beginning September 7th, our what they call team sports, which is volleyball and football, can begin their practices. And the individual sports, as UIL calls them, or cross country, tennis, and golf, they can begin working out beginning August 3rd. So those programs are gearing up for that. One of the things that's really going to be a, a, a challenge for our coaches is, is developing our plans for the dressing room use and locker rooms and making sure that we're following 50% uh, occupancy, entry and exit procedures, and just the sanitizing and everything that goes along with that. So those talks are beginning at this time, as well as with the, with the new order, we can't play any games or anything until September the 28th. Now, for us and many of the schools in Tarrant County, that's, that hasn't been an issue, but we have some schools that we play that are in our district that are part of other counties, and they can start their playing dates a little bit at different times. So we have DEC meetings coming up with all of our sports over the next several days, and we're all trying to work through what our athletic schedules are going to look like. All right, now for fine arts, David. So much like athletics, our extracurricular um, arts groups, which would be marching band and drill team, we were aligned and ready to go with the UIL um, regulations with minimum capacity and temperature checks and all those things. Um, since the Tarrant County order has come down, obviously we've been pushed outside as well. Um, we typically don't start our summer band activities until about two to three weeks prior to the start of school gearing for a football game in that first week. So since we've been pushed back to um, September for that first football game, we've pulled back on our summer band start to wait a little while since we won't have access to the buildings and we're going to have to limit our outdoor activity. Drill team has done similar, um, a similar plan where they've moved some of their instruction on online and gone virtual, and then they're doing a limited amount of small group work um, outside where they can. They've actually been seeking out some shaded areas, par park and those type of places to be able to work outside and, and to be able to deal with the heat. As far as the rest of our, our co-curricular and curricular classes, um, elementary music spent the summer working with the Center for Educational Fine Arts Development in Austin and they've done a lot of training on online virtual music training. Um, visual Arts has done the same. Um, both of our visual arts elementary and high school we're working to start to prepare what we call go bags, which will have a limited amount of actual art supplies in it, sketchbooks, higher quality paper, oil pastels, to be able to distribute because we know we've exhausted all of the at-home art projects that you could do when we were um, closed out of our buildings in the spring. Um, choir is ready to go with online instruction. Our two high school choir directors, Thomas Wren and Pauline Sexton, just actually finished hosting 
the uh, Texas Choir Directors Association online conference. They hosted 1,300 um, choir educators all virtually, so they're very much prepared for this virtual transition. And then finally, our theater folks. Um, I won't say it's a positive outcome of COVID, but we all know that Broadway got shut down, and so there are a lot of artists out there that are looking for ways to connect. So we've actually been doing some high school theater workshops over the summer where Broadway um, actors and other folks associated with the theater have been able to work with us online. And here locally, we've connected with the Director of Education at the uh, AT&T Performing Arts Center in downtown Dallas, and she's working to set up some um, unique interactions for us with staff as well as uh, folks that are working throughout the course of the year. So we have some, some really engaging lessons to be able to kind of grab back onto our kids as we start back up. That's awesome. Really cool, David Zarn. Appreciate you. All right, now to talk about our return to work procedures and accommodations, our Executive Director of HR, Gemma Pageant. Thank you, Brad, Board of Trustees. Um, I wanna start by saying how much we value our employees right now and what an emotional time this is for all of our employees. Um, in the HR department, we are really handling these cases on an individual basis and people are reaching out to us and we are spending the time to talk about their concerns with them and really listen to them. Um, we did survey our staff members because after September 27th, we know we will have some students who will be coming back into the building. And so our staff has indicated about 60% of them want to work face-to-face -face in front of students. And the other 40% of them want to work in an online setting from their um, classroom. We are working through some um, return to work accommodation requests right now. We have some people for different health reasons who are not going to be able to, based on their doctor's orders, come back to work. And so we're working individually through those, hoping that those teachers can um, receive an accommodation for working from home. And like I said before, we are working through all of those individually. Um, we are asking that as the school year starts, that all of our employees do report to work. Um, we think that um, the things that we have, the resources that we have available to them in their classroom and their offices will provide a better product for our student. And that being said, we are working individually with some of those people who are just unable to come to work. Right now, we have about um, 130 requests for workplace accommodations. And not all of those are a need to work from home. Some of them are still able to come into the building. Um, the substitute situation that we have, we are working right now to interview more subs. We have people who have said, hey, I'm, I'm ready and willing and I'd like to sub for you. We've had a lot that have said, now is not the time for me. So um, I have a few people in the department, two people actually who are interviewing subs, talking to subs, figuring out um, who can be a long-term sub because we do know that we will have some long-term absences and what that actually looks like. We're working um, on that plan right now. Um, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act is something that was put into place in the spring semester by the federal government. We do have, and we've used it a little bit over the summer. When someone is subject to a quarantine order, when they have been advised by their local health professional to quarantine or when they have or they're experiencing the symptoms of COVID, the um, Coronavirus Act, which we call it, pays for up to 10 days for that employee to be um, away from the campus, away from their work location to heal or to quarantine. Um, in some of those cases, the employees will be able to leave and go home and they'll still be able to do their job. But in other situations, they won't be. So um, the Coronavirus Act will uh, pay for up to 10 days for each employee, up to, a, up to um, $511 daily. But that information is on the HR website and it's been sent out a couple of times to employees and principals have that information also. Um, Brad, I think I hit it all. Okay. Well, thank you, Gemma. Appreciate you. And so as Gemma, mentioned what our staff data was as far as uh, you know in person or remote here you can see the latest uh, student data and to uh, walk us through and review this will be Laney um, 
uh, you can see there at the, the totals at the top and then the by campus uh, at the bottom. So Lainey, you wanna add anything in addition to that? Absolutely. So as we're coming to an end of talking about how we're going to be um, full remote ready in the fall, we're simultaneously preparing for when we come back and which families are committing to face-to-face -to -face and which ones are wanting to continue with remote instruction. As you can see, we have a ways to go um, in reaching out to our families and communicating how important it is as we make preparations um, for our return. And so we are continuing to work on our communication, reaching out to them so that we can um, prepare um, based off of these numbers, we still um, have a ways to go, but you can see the breakdown by campus. Um, and I will kick it over to Kristen to talk about our communication plan. Thank you, Lainey. Uh, that was a great segue. And first and foremost, I want to start out by saying there's been a lot of great information um, that has been shared in this presentation. And I want to assure you that we are going to be posting this online this evening. Um, we're going to be posting it on the fall 2020 page as well as the news article uh, on the home page. So the place to get news, uh, we are still sending the GCISD update. Um, we're putting everything in social media and then we have a new web page that is really our centralized hub for all information. And that is GCISD.net slash fall 2020. Um, we have the fall guide available there in both English and in Spanish. Um, it is updated regularly. I uh, put a screenshot in there of the content so that you can see when something is new. We are putting the date next to it. And when it's updated, we're putting the date next to it as well. So our families can really see where there's some new information. And then we also have quick links on the website um, where they're able to uh, register, see frequently asked questions. They can look at those sample schedules that were shared earlier. Um, and so that's kind of something that has on the side of the website. Brad, if you want to go to the next one, um, kind of some of the things that we're going to be focused on as a communications department is really, um, you know, communicating with our parents, staff, and our community. So our first area of focus is creating videos that feature GCISD staff members discussing the professional learning they've been doing this summer to prepare for the fall. Uh, we released a video last week with Ashley Duncan. I believe it has more than 5,800 views on Facebook so far. And we released one today with Tabitha Weeks. That's really great um, talking about her Canvas classroom. And so uh, we'll be sharing those on social media as well as the website. We are regularly updating the FAQs and are sharing that in the update and on social media. And we're working with instructional leadership to provide communication tools to our campus leaders. Um, we know from some previous surveying of our families that their campus newsletter is where they really go to get most of the news related to their student. And so creating those communication tools that we can share with the principals that they can then share with their families. Uh, so I'm going to kick it back over to Brad so that he can open it up for questions. Yeah, so I just want to just say thank you to Kristen and our communications team. They've done an amazing job over the last few weeks in developing those platforms that, to educate and inform our community. And, and that is ongoing. Uh, we will continue that. As uh, Kristen mentioned, this presentation is going on our website tonight. Uh, and as we receive new information daily, we, we try to update and inform our community as best as possible, as timely as possible. And so thank you, Kristen, you and your team. Uh, trustees, I know we threw a lot of information at you, um, but uh, we want to open it up to your questions at this time. We have, I think, roughly about 15 minutes. And so, um, you know, we're open to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Schnelz and your entire team that everyone presented today. You are right, that is a lot of information. Um, and being that this is the first time that we could come together um, after the directive was presented, unfortunately, there's a 72 hour uh, required timeline for us that we can't meet. And so this is the first time that we've read it and we've seen it in the board updates, but actually to hear about it. So this is a, almost an information overload um, and what we need to start doing and looking at, but I know we've got a lot of questions and I know we've got 15 minutes, but I'm going to ask you guys, um, the leadership team to be patient with this because more than likely we'll go over that 15 minutes, but that's okay. This is a very important um, topic and, and deals with um, affects a lot of people in our community. So I'm going to open it up trustees. Um, again, I now I can see Jorge. Um, I can see everyone now. So, um, does anyone have questions? Start out with some questions. Becky. 
Actually, Mindy had her hand up first. Oh, I'm so, so she, sorry. She first. I, she's down at the corner. I did not see Mindy. So, Mindy, please go ahead. Well, mine's a quick one. That was absolutely a wonderful presentation, and I thank you all all for the time that I know you've been putting into this all summer long. I did not notice a zero hour in the high school schedule, but I'm assuming they'll still have that opportunity. Uh, yes, we'll still have that opportunity for those kids uh, at the middle schools that, that take those zero hour courses. Traditionally, it'll just be virtually, obviously, and that's a that's a uh, a little bit different setup uh, for those for those students. But that that is our intention to still offer that those courses during that time. Thank you, Mindy. Um, Becky. Okay, I have more than one question. <laughs> Um, I'm, first thing, though, I want to echo what you said, Lisa, um, especially since, um, you know, we had to kind of pivot from the two options to one model here for a couple of weeks going into the, the beginning of the school year. And I really appreciate staff um, being able to, yet again, turn on a dime, which we've been doing all summer, and particularly our teachers who really haven't had a summer. Um, and I, I'm grateful as well. I'm just going to work backwards from my notes, so forgive me. Um, Gemma, on the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the 10 days, that's in addition to the leave that our employees traditionally have? Correct. Cool. Yes. Okay. Which is essentially two weeks. So we've kind of got the the opportunity, the ability here that um, much the same way that, you know, we've already seen some of these conditioning camps where the virus has been brought in from outside of the camp and shuts things down for two weeks, um, this act basically gives us, you know, one of those chances there where somebody brings it in that we've got we've got at least one built-in opportunity where we're not impacting teachers' um, regular leave. Is that correct? That's correct. And it applies to all of the employees, not just the teachers. Okay. Oh, right. Good to know, right? Because, I mean, I can imagine, you know, unfortunately, if a bus driver comes down with it and how that would then have a tremendous domino effect across even just one campus versus, mm -hmm. say, you know, Johnny in the third grade room brings it in, that's impacting the third grade room you know, Mr. Jones, the bus driver, that could be, you know, something very different. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, going back to communication, um, I, God bless staff, y'all don't have time to keep redoing, redoing, redoing stuff. If we could link this video from tonight's meeting, I think that would be huge. Um, it's one thing to read the PowerPoint, it's another thing to hear it and, and see staff walking through that the presentation that we just got. So I think some video um, link to this would be tremendously helpful. Um, just as an example, when the, the schedules were pushed out on Friday, um, parents were asking questions that were actually answered in small print right at the bottom of the schedule. And I don't blame them, they were hit with a lot very quickly and trying to decipher those schedules. Um, but having that explanation that's verbal and visual that goes along with what they're reading, I think would be tremendous. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, and speaking of videos, um, going back to the piece um, oh, on where y'all were talking about showing parents what things would look like and walking them through that, I think it would also be helpful if we had some student voice involved in this as well. So um, I, as an adult, um, especially as a trustee, have the benefit of, you know, knowing staff and knowing jargon and what y'all are talking about. Um, it's very different in my home, for example, of mom trying to reassure a kid that, no, she's not going to fail even before the first day of school has happened. Um, I think it might be helpful for um, maybe some of the kids who were more successful at the online um, this past year or even iUniversity prep kids who have experience to lend their voice to what this experience is like and ways in which it can work and can be positive. I, I think our students who are particularly, quite frankly, frightened 
of what this start of school year is going to look like, that reassuring voice from their peers might be just as helpful as, you know, us pushing information out to parents. Um, um, oh, going back to the schedules, recess. I know uh, Dr. Griffin talked about the fact that, you know, recess will be a part of this. I actually would encourage us to go ahead and put the word recess and block it in on the calendar. And the reason for that is, is that we have, um, particularly maybe even in our GT population, but somewhat overall, compliant kids whom when you put that schedule in front of them and the word recess is not on there, they will go to mom or dad and they will say, no, there is no recess. We can't do this. It doesn't say to do that. And so I think we need to be intentional and very aware. And so putting in that, even just research, recess, blocking it in, or a, a, a seventh inning stretch, something so that there is a cue in the schedule that yes, we are not, and, and, and I really applaud staff for the walkthrough they've done tonight. It's very clear this is not intended to be eight to three, you are tethered to your device, don't get up out of your seat um, except for a 30 minute lunch and you're gonna be online all day. Oh, huh, and at the beginning, I wanna buy a sonic drink to whoever did away with that ridiculous jargon of synchronous and asynchronous and changed it to live learning versus independent learning. That, uh, that is award-winning. Uh, it, it is so, people are asking, what's synchronous? What, I can't even, live learning versus independent learning, thank you so much. Can we please use that language that best fits our district instead of a bunch of jargon that nobody knows? Um, I really appreciate Dr. Rogers leading this off um, we are so incredibly fortunate here in GCISD to have the benefit of the top online learning school in the entire state and to have Dr. Rogers' expertise with us. And so I think um, she is a, a trusted voice in what this looks like and how it works and how it can be successful. And um, I, I think we should take advantage of, of her knowledge and her reassurance to parents and I think even to teachers too and to staff that um, while we, we all know this isn't ideal and I don't think I've met anybody who has said they don't want to be back in the classroom. Everybody, everybody wants to be back in the classroom. But the, the better we can make this successful and the fact that we've got something that most everybody doesn't have um, I, I would love to, to draw on her expertise. Um, those were kind of the biggest things. Oh, on attendance. Can we describe just a little bit more what checking attendance looks like, right? So what I'm hearing, especially from working parents, is, um, you know, what what is, how, how are you going to take attendance, right? If I have to work and um, I'm not there to ensure that my kid checked in at 9 a.m. Uh, how, what, can someone talk to us just a little bit more about what attendance looks like at each of the three grade levels, elementary, middle, and high school? I can take this. Um, the attendance, we have some options on how we take attendance. So there are gonna be layers of attendance in that there will be a designated time during one of the live teacher sessions that is our attendance period. The one thing that we have not put a lot of information out uh, that we're still working on, even if a student is not able to attend during that time, mm -hmm. uh, we will have uh, potentially recordings out of that so that a parent that may be working during the day could come back to help their child at another time. And then if a student has completed their assignments for that day, so while a teacher may um, submit attendance uh, for elementary, that's likely going to be directly into Skyward if the student is present during that attendance period, but then they can go back and amend their attendance okay. say the next morning if the student completed all of their assignments for the prior day. So 
that really gives us multiple options and being able to look at the overall engagement of the child, not only in the live teacher-led lessons, which we want them to be part of that, but also are they completing their work. Uh, with the secondary, um, Canvas is actually going to give us that option for attendance to be taken um, as they are present in those courses. Um, Dr. Grovel may want to speak to that a little bit more. Uh, yes, yeah, so a very, very similar model to uh, uh, what Dr. Shiver outlined there as as well. Uh, different from the spring is the is the still the the requirement now of the 90% uh, compulsory attendance, um, which is is it, uh, places a, a greater importance on making sure that our kids are engaged on a daily basis. Um, as Dr. Shiver outlined, uh, you know our goal is for every kid to be able to log into that live lesson. Uh, get the instruction from their teacher and, and use that as a point of engagement. Um, but also those 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 sessions being recorded uh, and students being able to connect uh, with uh, the the work uh, if, if there are inner troubles or some flexibility there. Um, having having that little bit of flexibility for our students and staff uh, uh, to make sure that the the work gets done and, and our students are engaged uh, on a daily basis um, will allow us that flexibility. So. Uh, Okay, thank you. Kind of along that same line where you mentioned um, connectability, um, going back to the technology piece where um, we we would check on kids after a month, um, is that only because with those hotspots we only get to see where they've, we only get a monthly update or we, I would think that we would want to check on them much more frequently if someone's not logging in, right, if we're not getting a hit. Okay. Excuse me. Absolutely. So we're going to see their activity from logging into things like Canvas and those other things daily. Okay. The, um, the um, tele telecom providers only show us updated records like on the 15th mm. month for a billing cycle. So that's where we can get it down to seeing the 30 day snapshot on that individual hotspot. So in regards to students just connecting in general, we're going to be paying a lot more attention to access into Seesaw, Canvas, and all the other platforms uh, outside of the hotspot. Mainly the hotspot one is to make sure that it's being used and we don't have one sitting out there oh, okay. that we're paying for that we could give to another student. Okay, okay. All right, I'll stop talking and let somebody else go now. Thank you, Becky. Anybody else? I'm not. Or uh, Jesse? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah just a, a general question is that, first of all, let me just back up and thank uh, a lot of great work has gone into uh, the presentation tonight and everyone, uh, thank you for all your comments and, and sharing that information with us. Uh, the one thing, and I, you know, there's some questions that Becky has already asked, so I can appreciate that. And I'm, I'm sure my fellow trustees have a, a, a lot of other questions. Uh, the one thing I'd like to just, ask is that everything I heard tonight is indeed based on the directive that we recently received that won't allow for, for in-person and asynchronous or synchronous, Becky, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, class to occur. But I guess my question is, if in the event that we then get a new directive that says that we have to shorten that time frame from the 28th to sooner, I guess my question to all the departments and everyone that answered, are we ready to again spend on a dime and be able to offer uh, in-person instruction a lot sooner, given that we've already laid out this plan? And I guess what I'm referring to is, I know Kyle, you mentioned the number of cameras that we would now be putting in the classrooms and, and then the meals and the social distancing that would be required for us to reconfigure the classrooms. Would all of those be ready in the event that we have to shift with another directive sooner. And um, so I'm just throwing that out there and anyone can answer. I just, I'm, I'm curious. I can speak from the technology side. The way we've designed the cameras in the classroom is if we needed to switch to everybody being completely remote again, including all of our teachers, it's about a five minute disassembly to get that camera down to allow it to go home with the teacher which would have an additional microphone and a better camera for them to use at home. So we initially designed it that way so that we could be flexible if we needed to be on site or go remote with that. Um, all the cameras 
uh, fill are of the 500 will be probably 75% installed by the day one of school and 25 will probably finish it that week is what we're looking at with all the cameras being installed. Well, thank you. But then, uh, Kyle, on the other side, not just technology, and please, yeah. I'm not just that. I'm in general. I'm just asking, though, all the other services that we're having to uh, address. Would we also be able to change again? My point is, if we have to, if a new directive comes out, can we begin in-person instruction given all of the restrictions and guidelines we must follow? Can we do that? And and if someone could just help me understand that. Well, I would, I would just say uh, the answer to your question is yes, we are uh, doing that. I will tell you that when we received the order from Tarrant County, we were able to focus on one type of mm -hmm. learning platform, and that's really helped us gain a lot of traction with the remote learning uh, platform. Okay. Uh, if, as you say, uh, there's a change to that to be in person, uh, uh, I believe our teachers are ready, uh, you know, I, you know the, that type of thing uh, I think will be uh, uh, quickly turned around. The kinds of things that are very difficult uh, in this setting with the pandemic happening, transportation, food service, uh, uh, you know, changing classes, assigning classes, making sure that we have social distancing within the, within the, the, uh, uh, the rooms, within the buildings and that kind of thing. We will work on that. It'll be round the clock uh, and, and we'll do it as quickly and as uh, uh, thoroughly as we possibly can to make that happen uh, on time. It is, um, uh, you know, it, it will be something that's difficult, but, uh, but it, that's also something that we've been thinking about throughout the summer. Yeah. We've just been focusing on remote instruction since the order came from, from uh, Tarrant County so that we could be prepared to be able to talk to our community, to make sure that we're assuring our, our students and our staff and our families that that we're going to have a fantastic remote instruction opportunity for them. But if we need to, uh, again, uh, pivot and, and put uh, uh, students into the, into the buildings, then, then that's, you know, uh, then we'll be working on that. If, is there a timeline? Uh, that really, <coughs> excuse me, it really depends. Uh, it depends on, uh, uh, you know, if, if, that, if that happens, soon maybe we would be ready by august the 17th and we likely would be uh if we have to wait any longer then it then it might uh, might push it out a little bit so all of that depend all all of that just depends on uh the timing but to answer your question we're we're going to be ready uh, whenever that time comes well thank you dr ryan that's exactly what i what i wanted to hear and and i really do appreciate that and there's no doubt that we will be but I just wanted that uh, to hear the reassurance, and, I, and I'm glad to hear that. So, so thank you. That's that's my question. Thank you so much, Jesse. Do we have any other questions at this time, Doug? I do. Oh, okay. um, well, I, I want to thank everybody because it's a, an enormous amount of work that goes into this, and it's a um, you know it's a it's a new world. <laughs> um, it's going to create a lot of challenges. Um, I I, I remember. I'm glad that you mentioned two things in the, in the presentation, the, the, the building relationships and engaging students, which are both going to be much harder to do, especially with the kids who are transitioning to a new school or our younger elementary kids. Um, and it's frankly going to be a, a challenge for parents as well to provide that support at home. Um, but I, I, one question I've got, I've, I've got a thousand questions and uh, I won't ask them all because a, a lot of them are more nuts and bolts questions. but. Um, Substitute teachers, how are we training those to, so that they're ready to step in if necessary? Right now we're gauging who can, who wants to sub for us and we're gauging the need. We will have some substitute teachers that will be able to do the online instruction and we'll train those with the CNI and technology teams. And then we have, we'll have some substitutes that will just be better face to face. And so something I failed to mention earlier, I want to mention it now, we are, for safety reasons, assigning subs to certain campuses to limit exposure. And so we are making sure and, and we're creating those lists now with our substitutes and with our principals so that one sub will go to one campus. Okay. Laura, thank you. Hey, thank you. 
Thank you, Doug. And I, like you said, you've got to, I know we have a lot more questions um, and you said a lot of years of nuts and bolts. And I know we're going to be able to come back. I see you, Becky. Um, um, I know we'll be able to come back together um, and get a lot of those or individually get a lot of our questions um, answered. Um, Becky. Um, yeah, so with regard to um, to teachers and uh, are we going to be able to do kids you for teachers even when we're in this virtual environment? Do we know an answer or how that might work yet? We we are collecting information from our staff on what their needs are related to school age child care. Uh, and using that information that we started collecting, and I believe their deadline to have that submitted to us is maybe tomorrow. And from that information, we'll be able to move forward with our plans and how we can support that need. Okay, thank you. Okay, get everyone answer that I'm seeing. And I've lost seeing Jorge again. If we have Jorge, I don't know why, but I've, I've lost Jorge. If we have questions on that, I know um, in the um, monthly update is we're going to continue on this and look at Seesaw and um, talk about the technology. So I know we'll have some more questions there. So if we don't have questions, what I'd ask before we go into our regular session, if we can just take a quick break. Um, kind of get things together before we go into our session. But I would like to say again, um, thank you to each and every one of you here and those who are not here that have been just working tirelessly. And, and please understand that we know you are. And, and I ask that our community understand and know that you are. That the first thing we have to be is flexible. The second thing I ask is that we show grace. We show grace to each other. We show grace to our teachers. We show grace to our um, leadership team and understand that our number one priority here are your students and the safety of your students and the safety of our teachers. But grace goes a long way and we are in this together and we will get through this together. And uh, that's just what I ask of our community is that we just show that compassion and understanding to, to everybody in our community right now. So. I, I thank you all again and um, for the slideshow and the information. And I know we're going to have a lot more questions and um, I know you'll be there to answer them. So we thank you again. So at this time, if we could, Dr. Ryan, take a quick um, five minute to even that break and then we'll come back into um, regular session. Is that good with y'all? Thumbs up. Okay. Thank you all very much. So, Kyle, you'll take us out of this. I will. I uh, will put us into close and get everybody moved over. Thank you, sir. <laughs> 